we're heading this morning. Exodus chapter number 17 is where we are heading this morning. So if you need a Bible, shoot your hand in the air. Someone will get a Bible to you. Our dear sister Becky, and she, you know, I, I'm so glad that people pray for uh, me and our family who we engage in ministry. Uh, she, she, she sent me an email last night and said that uh, one of the prayers that I pray often when I'm trying to engage in some of this work is the prayer of Francis. And the prayer of Francis uh, asks God to help us to be an instrument of his peace. Yeah. And where there is uh, anger, maybe so uh, peace. And where there is uh, uh, hatred, maybe so love. And where there is war, maybe so nonviolence. I mean, just a, a wonderful, wonderful prayer. And she said that God gave her a, a song arrangement of that prayer. Amen. And uh, I was trying to listen to it last night, but I couldn't. So I'm so excited that we all get a chance to hear it all together. Uh, do you want to come and introduce it at all? Are you? No? You okay? Right. Becky is a very talented, talented musician. And, uh, you know, um, I thank God that uh, somebody needs some inspiration from the Holy Spirit as we engage in this work that is so very difficult. Amen. Um, so uh, I ask you just to kind of close your eyes for a few moments and allow uh, this song to kind of minister to you. And I hope that it kind of sets the stage for what we'll talk about today as we begin to uh, preach and teach the Word of God. Why it is you and I should not 
be people who condone violence, but we should still be people who fight. Amen. Amen. And uh, prayerfully, uh, we can uh, get to the end of this and appreciate uh, that there is a fight. There is a fight that all of us, the people of God, must engage in. Uh, but this fight must be fought not with the weapons of our own warfare, but the, with the weapons of God. Give me a high five and tell them I got some weapons from God. Amen. So let us uh, kind of start to do some work here in this text and kind of uh, make some, some good, I think, principles that are true regardless of uh, the, the presence of the violence. And let us imagine then, given our present context, what we and how we may respond to the challenges that come in our lives. Verse number 8, Exodus chapter 17 says, And Amalek came and fought Israel at Rephidim. And Moses ordered Joshua. Joshua was one of Moses' young mentees, if you will. Moses ordered Joshua, select some men for us and go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will take my stand on top of the hill, holding God's staff. And Joshua did what Moses ordered in uh, order to fight Amalek, meaning that he went and he chose some folk to get out there and do their part, fill their role, if you will. And Moses, Aaron, and her went to the top of the hill. And it turned out that whenever Moses raised his hand, Israel was winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek was winning. But Moses' hands got tired. So they got a stone and set it under Moses. And he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on each side. So Moses' hands remained steady until the sun went down. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his army in battle. And God said to Moses, write this up as a reminder to Joshua to keep it before him. Because I will most certainly wipe the very memory of Amalek from the face of the earth. So Moses built an altar and he named it Jehovah Nisi, or God is my banner. For he said, this is the hand upon the banner of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. All right, so we're going to spend a few moments speaking simply from the topic, keep your hands up. We win. Somebody holler, hands up. We win. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name, we pray that the people of God say amen. amen. Just practice that real quick. Everybody throw your hands up. Uh, tell your neighbor, we win. Amen. 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 Now, now, lest you think that I'm just being totally caught up in the present uh, kind of context of our moment, I uh, certainly uh, will admit that, you know, it is something that is weighing heavily on my mind. For this whole week, I watched young people and elderly folk, women and children, uh, men, men, uh, uh, using this hands up, don't shoot chant uh, while they face down, or what dare I say, while we face down the barrel of machine guns and tear gas uh, launchers and uh, heavy uh, armored tanks that were right in front of our faces. As we lifted up our hands, uh, we were faced with all kinds of uh, racial and and dehumanizing language and threats and physically manhandled. And it was very apparent to me that uh, perhaps this hands up chant was more than just some catchy phrase. But I began to imagine as I stood there on the front of one of those mines with the police uh, with their assault rifles trained on me and a group of us as we stood between them and a number of the the protesters, young men, many of whom, once you touch them, they begin to cry. Because they were so overwhelmed with anger, and so overwhelmed with a sense of, of hopelessness, uh, but yet 
someone who had some hope was able to touch them and melt all that pain away. I, I stood there, and as I had my hands up, I began to think of all of the verses yes. that call the people of God to lift up your hands. Yes. And it made me think that hands up is more than just a catchy phrase. That is a response to an injustice. That's right. But perhaps sometimes bad things happen because, or they happen and they cause. Some of us to remember that what the Word of God says to us may still have some redeeming power in our lives. Because quite frankly, a lot of folks out there, I'm sure we ain't read their Bible in a long time. A lot of us in here. Amen. <laughs> Who ain't read their Bible in a long time. But I believe that many of us come out of the womb of some folk who had this Bible, this scripture, just, just marinating all through their spirit and in their DNA. I read a study this week that talked about how trauma, the, 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 the bio, uh, what you call those folks, genetic folk are starting to understand that trauma could be transferred through DNA. That the trauma that my great grandfather felt by 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 having to grow up in the, the racist South, the trauma that my grandfather felt by watching his his twin brother be killed on some train tracks for whistling at a white woman. That trauma that, that even I have had to endure by being beat up by these police. And that trauma is transferable across generations. And some of you might say, well, that's not very promising, Pastor Mike. Well, I feel like if the trauma can pass, how many of you know so can the word of God? Yeah. I know some of us feel like, well, I'm not going to worship the God of my ancestors, the God of my parents, but whether you want to worship God or not, that's in your DNA. Pulling out these passages. 
messages that call us to be people who are prone to lifting our hands. Yes. Yes. The lifting up of hands has so many connotations. Then when you really begin to study it as a spiritual practice in the word of God. It is not an acknowledgement that you and I at some point in our life have to surrender. It is an acknowledgement that there is a time in our lives where the lifting up of our hands is an act of prayer. There is a time when the lifting up of our hands is because we are reaching for something that is beyond our grasp. There is a time when the lifting up of our hands is about us helping someone. And sadly, there is a time when the lifting up of our hands is also about harm. Life has shown us that there are moments when we lift our hands, we are reminded that we are not in control. Now, if you know, that truth is a truth that many people are uncomfortable with. Amen. You want to be in control. Yeah. I want to be in control. Yeah. We want to be in control. But how many of you know you ain't in control? Yeah. But I can't control if they're going to shoot. No, right. I can't control if I'm going to, you know, get married. But I can't control if my partner is going to be there for the rest of my life. There are many things that you can't control. But how many of you know there are many things you can't right. control? Right. And this culture and generation that has become largely post-religious and antichrist. Force ones. 
just rocking me. But this cop, unbeknownst to me, was the sergeant, the guy head of this, I guess, group of cops. And later on, uh, I posted it on my Facebook page. This cop uh, was speaking in a video where he said, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I'm also a killer. I've killed a lot, and if I need to, I'll kill a lot more. And it made me ask the question, what is it about us and the way we are shaped in Western Christianity, American Christianity, that we can claim to follow the ways of Jesus and in the same breath be a killer? Unless you think it's just the police out there, I know a lot of homies who know that, you know, they go to heaven when they die. They gonna spend their life with Jesus, even though here on this earth they killing folk too. What is it about Christian faith in America that we can be murderers and still say we follow Jesus? Does not the Scripture say in Hebrews, "Follow peace with everyone"? Mm-hmm. And I know there's some folk that you just can't make peace with. Amen. How many of you know, hands up means that I'm not going to fight you with your weapons. All right. All right. All right. Amen. Hands up means that I'm going to pray for you. Amen. Because I don't just fear the one who can destroy the body. All right. But Jesus said you ought to fear the one who can destroy both.
relationship with God. Someone said, Pastor, aren't you scared to die? I'm not scared to die. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. I don't want to die. But if I have to lift up my hands and believe that God can keep me from falling, I pray God will give you and I the courage to do the right thing. Even when everybody else is telling us it's not going to work. Somebody holler and lift up your hands. Be clear, there are many issues today that require a certain and a hands up theology, a hands up sensibility is not one that uh, causes inertia or paralyzes you. I'm not talking about a paralysis of analysis, but when you have a real threat and a serious injustice, uh, and when you have a concrete struggle, you want to know that there is a response in the face of such hardship. But, and understand, child of God, I'm not just talking about Ferguson. No. Focusing on 
folk who on fire about justice, but they on fire about their own personal maturation. Yeah. Yeah. Your own morality. You're the meanest, <laughs> most bullying person in the room. Because you sure can tell a good speech. <laughs> is righteousness. The children of God will always face threats both internal and external. And here in this story, we find an example of an external threat that, that made themselves apparent even while the children of Israel were trying to get their own stuff worked out. They on their way to the promised land. They have an internal struggle. But how many of you know sometimes an external struggle Uh-huh. There, there, just, just give you a concrete example. When 9-11 happened, everybody was in America. <laughs> they asked me to sing God Bless America. I said, I ain't I don't know that song. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> 